today I'd like to talk about focus. I'd like to start off with some words of Jesus. What do you seek? The physical versus the spiritual. The mind versus the body. The eternal question. So, do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? In other words, the physical needs that we have. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things, the things, will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I wanted to start with that because when I was considering the topic, I wanted to think about what is it that we need to be doing in our daily lives in order to get closer to God, in order to get closer to our life's, fulfilling our life's mission, our life's work. And I've given a couple of <coughs> topics regarding the distractions that we face because the biggest problem that I can see for all of us in today's world is fighting through the distractions that we are faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. We are literally bombarded with distractions. And these simply just take us away from our life's work and our life's mission. They don't serve us a useful purpose, but they are useful tools that we need to learn to master. But if we don't master them, they will master us. So how many of us are in control of our social media habits? How many of us are in control of our work? How many of us feel in control in our own families? How many of us feel in control of our own lives? If we are not carving out our destiny, then something else is at work. So <clears throat> as the old uh, adage goes, if you're not creating your dream, then you're helping build someone else's. So <clears throat> it's important for us to think about, to consider what is it that we are focusing on. Here's another quote. What you focus on grows. What you think about expands. And what you dwell upon determines your destiny. When I looked up that quote, it was attributed to probably like 10 different people. So <laughs> it's obviously something that runs deep in the human consciousness. And I don't know who said it first, but we all somehow understand this is true, that what we focus on expands <coughs> and grows. There was an experiment done by a couple of scientists in 1999, Daniel J. Simons and Christopher Chabry. And they were looking into this uh, idea called sustained inattentional blindness, where you're looking at something and there's nothing visually wrong with your eyes, but you can't see it. So they did this experiment where they had subjects look at a short video of two teams playing a ball game, a white team and a black team. And they said, okay, here's the job you need to do. I want you to look at this clip and tell us how many times does the team dressed in white pass the ball? So pay attention. And so they ran the clip. It was about a minute long. And the players are on the screen and they're passing the ball amongst each other. And at the end of the clip, they asked the subjects how many times. And the subject said, 15. And that was the correct answer. Hooray, yes. Now, did you see the gorilla? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what gorilla? And they said, okay, run the clip again. This time, don't look at the passes, just look for the gorilla. And so they're looking at the clip, and sure enough, halfway through the clip, in plain view, not off to the side, right in the middle of the stage, a gorilla, a man dressed in a gorilla outfit, comes into the middle of the field where these people are playing and starts beating his chest in a typical gorilla fashion and then walks off the set. 
And people are amazed that they didn't see this. So, and this is quite, uh, this can be scientifically explained in that we are very conservative about what information we're taking in with our eyes. And uh, I don't want to go into the scientific detail um, because I don't understand it all, but also because it's not necessary. The thing is that what you are not looking for, you can't see. That's the, end, that's the, uh, that's the idea there. So, for instance, if you're looking to buy a car, and you're looking into getting, for instance, a uh, Toyota, uh, a p particular brand of Toyota, let's say a Sienna, okay, a model rather, and uh, you're starting to look at Toyota Siennas. And guess what you're going to see on the road everywhere around you? Yeah. Right? What you focus on grows. What you focus on expands in your consciousness. You start to see it everywhere. Um, the founder of Amazon, he was working at a hedge fund in New York, but he wasn't happy and he was looking for an opportunity. And during that time, he had employed a, um, a, a, a concept called regret minimization framework. So he imagines himself at 80 years old and he asks himself this question. After reading this article, just this one article about the internet, how the internet was exploding, and this is back in the late 90s, and he asked himself the question, at 80 years old, will I, will I have regretted leaving Wall Street? Yes or no? And will I have regretted not seizing the opportunity of the internet? Yes or no? And so for him, with that framework, he seized his opportunity. He left his well-paying job and got to work in his garage and started Amazon.com. Looking for an opportunity helps you to see an opportunity. Jeff Bezos was looking for an opportunity, and he saw an opportunity where many people didn't. When you're looking for a gorilla, you will see a gorilla. Are there any gorillas in this room? Have you looked for one? <laughs> so, when I was on MFT, mobile fundraising team, for those of you not familiar, that was an aspect of our church life where we were living in vans, driving around the country and selling products to raise money for, at that time, it was a Russian-American student exchange. It was the early 90s and uh, we were all very excited about the, asp the, the prospect of uh, reuniting with our, our Russian comrades who had um, been behind the Iron Curtain for many generations or several generations. So we were working very hard for that to happen, to see unity amongst these two groups. And um, we were drinking in God's Word every day. Morning service, evening service, prayer. It was a wonderful time period where you are focusing on God's will. And you're going out there focusing on God's will and seeing God and Satan working and thinking about God and Satan, thinking about God and Satan working in your own soul. And guess what you are seeing every day in every aspect? You are seeing God at work and Satan at work. And it was wonderful and scary at the same time. When God was working, it was wonderful. Sometimes you had these experiences where you just felt overwhelmed with emotion at God's love. And sometimes you felt like a sense of fear because you felt like Satan was really chasing you. But because you're focusing on that, you can see it. <clears throat> so we are surrounded by distractions. And this is, in, my, in many ways, a wonderful thing, but it's a very deadly thing. It can take us away from our main purpose of being. As you saw uh, from those testimonies in the video, especially the last lady, Ricky, I didn't catch her last name, but she thought she knew what her purpose was. 
But then she discovered by opening her mind that that wasn't her purpose at all. And she had to go through a process of self-discovery to figure out what that was and then to stick with it. And by doing so, she not only became happier, but I'm sure she also became wealthier as well. So we need to be humble. We need to be humble. This might come as a shock to our teenagers that we don't know everything. And Socrates, nearing the end of his life, famously said so. And he was a very knowledgeable person. So for him to come to that conclusion that the only thing he's certain of was the extent of his own ignorance was a very humbling uh, process for him. And in the uh, end of the last day's chapter in Divine Principle, there's this line. We should constantly make effort to have the right faith by, by searching both in spirit and in truth. It comes at the end of the chapter where they're discussing the failure of John the Baptist and how Christianity for thousands of years has looked up to John the Baptist as being the standard bearer of tradition, the model citizen of what it means to be an obedient servant of God. And yet, it turns out, at closer examination, that unfortunately, great though he was, dedicated though he was, passionate though he was, John the Baptist actually failed in, in his mission. John the Baptist was actually wrong in his estimation of who Jesus was. And so let us not make the same mistake in our life. Passion does not, is not the same as progress. Passion is not necessarily make you right. For instance, when we look at the life of St. Paul, before he became St. Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. And he was a passionate person, dedicated to the destruction of Christians. And he was relentless. I imagine that Christians heard about this guy and they were afraid of him because he was dedicated to his task of seeking out Christians and destroying them. Until he met God, until his eyes were opened, well they were blinded at first, but then they were opened. He was on that path, he was on that track. And then he was, his life was turned around. I'm sure it was a very humbling experience for Paul. You can imagine that all his life he has this focus and then all of a sudden he finds out that he's wrong. How do you think that made him feel? And then how do you think it made him feel having to explain to his friends and family that he's, he's been wrong all these years? Was that an easy thing for him to do? It must have been emotionally gut-wrenching for Paul to turn his life around. And I think it's like that for many people. But the people that lack the same courage that Paul had, I think for them it's easier to keep living the lie rather than face the facts, face the truth, admit you're wrong, repent, change your life direction, and keep going. I think that's our life challenge. And I think it's probably easier if we just stay humble in the first place rather than arrogantly insist that we're right. Because the fact of the matter is, we don't know everything. And uh, we never will. So we should always, yes, be dedicated to the task at hand, but always be questioning our beliefs, always be questioning our understanding, and always be seeking the truth in spirit. So that is our task at hand and how we're going to navigate through the confusion of the last days is by having that simple framework and attitude. Seek the truth, speak the truth. Seek the truth, speak the truth. I think it's no accident that a person like Jordan Peterson who's exploded across the internet in the last 12 months is becoming so uh, regarded in today's world and that's simply his, his message is very simple what is his message his message is 
seek the truth, speak the truth. Be true to yourself, be true to the people around you, because when you lie to yourself and you lie to the people around you, that is the beginning of totalitarianism. That is the beginning of awful things that we've already experienced in the 20th century. When we look at the 20th century and how bloody it was and the body count of all the people that lost their lives, then we know what hell looks like. We just look back a hundred years and we can see in full display what hell looked like. So we don't want to go there again. We must speak the truth and seek the truth. So what is God's focus? God's focus, and this is hard for people to believe because they look around the world and they see all this chaos and destruction and they put it at the foot of God and say, God is to blame. How can God be a God of love? How can God be a loving, all-powerful, all-seeing God when all this is going on? And yet, here it is. God, his central focus, has focused on love from the beginning and throughout his present course. And he will do so for eternity. Coupled with that is the giving us of responsibility. Because in order for love to be actuated, in order for love to be realized, a free response needs to be available. You can't program a robot to love you. You can't program something that is just instinctually attuned to loving, to love you. You have to give free will, invest love, and then hope for a response in kind. So God invested everything, and Adam and Eve betrayed that love. And when we look at love in action, we can see it in the life of Jesus. We can see it in the life of Reverend Sun Myung Moon. We can see it in the life of many saints and sages throughout history. James Chisholm. Who sacrificed themselves and didn't always get what they deserved. In most cases, they, they didn't. So that is God's focus. What is the founder of this church's focus? In my background, there were many incidents that evoked indignation at unjust treatment. Although many were very terrible to endure, I clenched my teeth and focused on occupying Cain's world. I had to digest the, the Cain world. How bitter this has been. It was as if I had to melt something as frigid and huge as an iceberg. Digesting this bitterness, I have had to silently bring Satan to submission. And uh, forgive me if I get the uh, pronunciation wrong, but the author, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he wrote the, Ar the Gulag Archipelago. And basically, after his life of first of all supporting communism and then being locked up in jail and sent to the Gulags in Siberia by the communists, he finally came to the realization of who he was, what he had done, what the truth was, and turned his life around. He endured cancer and inhumane treatment and basically um, wrote this um, compendium, if you like, on communism and basically nailed communism the, the coffin tightly shut by his work. After that, no intellectual could ever defend communism because of what he had done. So his work wasn't done with a spirit of meanness. It was simply done from an intellectual point of view. This is what communism is. This is what it does. This is what it tries to do. This is the reality. There it is, all on the table. And because of this, he was able to basically bring an end to the defense of communism by intellectuals. And that was a decision 
based upon what had happened to him. Because again, the thing that we are in control of is not what happens to us all the time, but how we respond to it. Jesus' response to being betrayed, to being um, railroaded, to being crucified unjustly for no crime was to love. And that response shattered Satan's veil, Satan's foothold on the world. What if Jesus had died resentfully, spitting and cursing on the cross? Do you think Christianity could have survived? Do you think it could have existed if Jesus had displayed the same reaction that you and I would have done? <laughs> Hanging there on the cross, spitting and cursing. Bleep, 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 and bleep, 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 bleep. Okay, those were his last words? Okay, write them down. Put them in the Gospels. Let's all pray to this guy. No. We choose our response. And if we're not tuned in to God, we don't have the strength to come up with a godly response. Imagine the ocean, okay, the vast power of the ocean. And imagine a cup, okay? Now, in a sense, we are all part of the ocean. We're all a part of God. There is a part of God in each and every one of us. But what happens when you take that cup and you pull it out of the ocean? What can that one cup do separate from the ocean? Not a lot. How long can that cup? You can't even go on. Anyway. So <laughs> you get the analogy. Pour the cup back. Let us reconnect ourselves with God and be able to do incredible things with God's power. Imagine this microphone if it's unplugged. It can't do anything. Imagine this light bulb connected to the central grid system, unplugged. It can't do anything. What are we like, unplugged? We have a battery. We can run on battery for a while, but after a while that drains, and we find ourselves crucified on the cross, spitting and cursing at the world, instead of staying in a moment of connectedness with God. I remember reading this, I wish I had this quote, but I remember reading this in one of Father's, um, Reverend Moon's uh, testimonies of his life in Hungnam prison, where he's locked up in a concentration camp. And one day, there was this bully who used to go around stealing other people's food and beating them up. And Reverend Moon confronted him, and scolded him, and basically put him in his place. And then Reverend Moon said he felt God's spirit leave him. And he said that was the scariest time he had ever spent in that jail. And he prayed desperately for three days to reconnect with God's spirit. He felt the, the, the need to so strongly that he needed to be with God. And finally, he was able to reconnect after enough repentance. And the lesson he got from that was, God was simply trying to tell him, I don't want you to deal with people like that. I don't want you to correct my children in that manner. That was the lesson. And it told me two things. First of all, God loves everyone. And there is a plan by which God wants to save everyone. And the second thing it told me was that our founder was addicted. He was an addict. He was a God's love addict. <laughs> and he desperately spent his whole life trying to serve God, trying to help God, trying to liberate God from his suffering. So that is the founder's focus, to walk in the valley of death and absorb it and digest it and win victory over 
it. So what is our focus? What should our focus be? After passing through the bottom of hell, we will reach the kingdom of heaven. The shortest path is to plunge through the bottom of hell. That's the shortest path. Come on, guys, let's go. <laughs> this is why we focus on sacrifice and service, isn't it? If you say, I believe in the Unification Church in order to gain my salvation, you get a zero. You will never be able to reach the worldwide level. You should rather say, I will go this way in order to liberate God, set true parents free, and save the world. Do you understand? That is what is different. So if somebody tells you, go to hell, you can say, I'm trying. So, think about your day. Think about what you're focused on. Are you focused on anything in particular? Is it work? Is it your kids? Is it your spouse? Is it money? Is it love? Is it, what is it? Is it God? Is it setting God's heart free? Is it focusing on deepening your relationship with God? Because what Jesus was telling us was think about God. Think about the spiritual needs of your life and all these other things will fall into place. But it's very difficult for us to have faith in that because we don't really see role models in our daily life, do we? The role models that are thrust upon us by social media, how many of those people in the social media spotlight live a spiritual life of goodness and showing us the path forward on how we can accomplish all these things by putting first things first? What about your friends? How many of them are having a good influence on you, helping you to live a life focused on godly things? What is it that we can control? We can't control social uh, society. We can't control the government. We can't control most things. So what can we control? We can control our response. So should we allow ourselves to be distracted by things that are taking us in an opposite direction? Should we allow ourselves to be pulled this way and that way if those ways or that way is not taking us in a godly direction? We can control our response. That is the, really the only thing we can control. We can't control our children. I know I can't. <laughs> Women, you cannot control your husbands. Stop trying. <laughs> now there's a shortcut through the bottom of hell. We can't, there's so many things we can't control. And yet here we are, struggling in our life, going along our daily business, trying to make sense of this world, trying to do the right thing. Let's give ourselves a break. Give ourselves moments in the day where we can just sit down and let God speak to us. And let ourselves speak directly to God. Let's give ourselves the opportunity to focus on the things that really matter so that we can get those right. And I believe, I don't know, because I'm not there yet, but I believe that if we do that, these other things will fall into place. Let's give it a shot. Please join me in prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our lives. Thank you so much for the love that you give us. We're so sorry that most of it goes over our head, like throwing pearls before swine, as the saying goes. We don't really understand what you're doing for us most of the time. Help us to respond to this realization by making time for you in our daily life. Making time to meditate, making time to pray, making time to read your word, making time 
to do the most important thing first. And then we pray that you can guide us more fully, that we can receive your love more deeply, and we can plot the chart of our lives in a more godly fashion. Please bless each and every one of us so that we can be a blessing upon others. We thank you and we offer you this prayer through Christ our Lord, our Jew and our man. All right, let's take some time to connect and talk about what our focus is. <laughs>